In session, Jack Rickard, EDTV. That would be me. I'm Jack Rickard with Electric Vehicle Television, and I'd like to welcome you all to the second annual Electric Vehicle Conversion Convention for 2012. Richard, Alice, and Phyllis, certainly, and, uh, and we're here. Um, let's get started. I usually open it up with some housekeeping announcements. Um, I don't really have a whole lot. Uh, we have such a large number of returning people. Um, but I would admonish you briefly that um, there, we are completely cognizant of the expense uh, not just registering for the convention, but from taking uh, nearly a week out of your lives and your businesses, the uh, somewhat heroic logistics of coming here at all and uh, putting up in a hotel and so forth, uh, never mind the people that have brought, brought equipment and cars to the event. It's uh, almost uh, a thing of a wonder that any of you would bother. Uh, it's uh, so much trouble. I would say that um, the convention is not precisely about me going to CBD TV uh, every week, um, but I found in the past, in 12 years of trade shows, that often if you can get people from a peer group who have a great deal in common in the same room with, with each other, that some remarkable and accelerated things happen. And so most of the value you will get out of this convention is actually sitting next to you. Now, if you uh, fortunately were kind of more of a mature crowd, I normally address this uh, uh, type of thing to younger people. If you want to be shy and hang back by the wall and uh, uh, kind of watch what's going on, you're going to miss a big part of it. Get in and grab somebody you don't know and find out what they do and how they do that. And that will maximize the value you'll get out of this convention. There's a couple of, of things, uh, that I suppose there's some depressing news, but there's more, for me, good news um, in this group and what you do, and, um, and we should probably talk about that a little bit. On the depressing side, uh, we have some serious uh, problems. I won't go into environmental issues. There's uh, plenty of people cognizant about that. But our media and our leadership in the country have rather failed us in, to my way of thinking, in identifying some of the serious um, issues that are going on. And part of the reason we do what we do and you do what you do is that moving to electric drive for our uh, uh, transportation needs kind of knocks out six or eight serious problems in one fell swoop. And um, so I've kind of become dedicated to it, I know you all have. But in recent news, uh, on September 6th, China opened the China Force and announced they would be trading um, oil for Remembi, or Yuan is their, their uh, increment, but Remembi is the people's money in China. And on September 7th, Russia signed on to provide unlimited oil to that oil market. Now I know that we uh, went into Iraq uh, in a well-intentioned effort to um, find weapons of mass destruction and replace it out the same. Or I hope so. But I would note that in the year 2000 um, that Iraq started trading oil for your dollars. And no one in the US media reported this at all, ever even once. And I know that you're all concerned about Iran and their nuclear capability because you've been told that they're about to get one and we must stop it even at the cost of the lives of our children. Iran has no nuclear capability in it. It would be an act of gravity to find for them ever to have. All uranium they have access to is um, essentially poisoned by power. But in 2006, on Kirsch Island, they established the Iranian force to trade oil uh, for Iranian money, 
Chinese remedy for euro dollars. And our uh, sanctions, our economic sanctions have nothing to do with pressuring the Iranians not to produce uh, nuclear power. It's an attempt to cut off their banking system so that money doesn't leak out into the world. And there's a very good reason for that. In 1971, we went off the oil standard and having somewhat better leadership at the time, a very bright guy named Henry Kissinger went to uh, uh, the House of Saud and proposed that all sales of oil by OPEC be done in U.S. dollars. And in an action that was classified top secret by the federal government for 30 years, did a trade where they could buy U.S. Treasuries off auction at a, at a very advantageous price. And so basically, we went off the gold standard, went on the oil standard. And today, 65% of all world trade is done in U.S. dollars. And 60% of the money we printed does not even reside in the United States. If you're going to buy oil and insulate yourself, from the swings of currency trading for your oil supply, you have to have a reserve of U.S. dollars, and almost every country on the planet does. So we've had a monopoly in petrodollars, and I would posit that whatever we did to Iraq, and whatever you think we may should do to Iran, we're probably not going to try to do to China. And the end of the petrodollar is on September 6th, of 2012, kind of like December 7th, 1941, or September 11th of um, 2001. So, uh, it's kind of a significant date. Has anyone read any of this in the newspaper, magazines, the television, anywhere? Well, I mean, me too. <laughs> You notice we're not precisely mainstream media. I have built a television show designed to drive people away. If you can endure two, two hours and 40 minutes this week, you can learn all the secrets of the universe. But it's hard work. So that's the depressing news. And obviously the solution is electric vehicles. I uh, asked Richard to start around the hall a uh, set of uh, neodymium magnets would you uh, try to separate those and then pass it to the next guy? Last night it dawned on me, a lesson that I learned two years ago, maybe four years ago. My grandson, after a trip to Lowe's, he found a magnet in a drawer and then wanted two, and I bought him from him. And at the age of four, he's playing with these magnets and he says, Grandpa, is that what makes his electric car, cars go? And I almost went into shock. This is something I can't really explain to adults, and there's a four-year-old that figured it out in the backseat by himself. <laughs> but we had uh, John Medrick uh, is here, president of Nedra, and he was amazed that, that you turn a shaft, and if you short two of the terminals, you can't turn it by hand. And we have an entire industry that's grown up, which uh, actually affords us some very good 12-volt WM controllers if you need to control a 12-volt motor from a whole army of people who believe that they can make hydrogen from water using the output of the alternator, put it in their gasoline, and get 900 miles per gallon. Having a shop that I have, for some reason they tend to be drawn to EVTV motorverts and want to come in and explain to me how to do this, so I hear from the six of them a week. We have a copper floor helmet that I offer to let them wear, to block out the cosmic rays and to prevent them from reading their thoughts <laughs> until they get this uh, developed and patented. But it's based on a simple fact. Most people's realization of an electric motor is that it turns free because you can pick up any electric motor and turn it. And so it all operates by magic. And so there's no cost to turn that alternator to make that electricity, to make that hydrogen, to put it in a gasoline, whatsoever. But in truth, it's the most powerful, absolutely irresistible force on the planet. And indeed, we're all made up of atoms that are mostly space. 
and we've been taught from a young age about this solar system looking thing with the atom without really a true sense of scale. If we put the nucleus of a lithium atom here in Cape Girardeau and made it the size of a basketball, the electron in the outer valence band in orbit would be about the size of a BB and it would bisect New York and Los Angeles in its orbit. It's almost entirely space. And so your reality, everything you see around you and yourself, if you put the two fingers together, they're touching, right? Nothing touches. This is actually all about repelling charges. Electrons do not like to be together. And the closer you bring them together, the more they resist it. You cannot force two into contact. Nuclear power that you've been taught about is actually nuclear fission, where we split the nucleus and cause a conversion of matter to energy under Albert Einstein's formula. And I would reckon it akin to uh, rubbing sticks together to make fire. It's a very crude process. There's nothing elegant about it. Atomic power, as I was taught in the 50s, um, was really nuclear fission. And your cars run on atomic power, that's true, and quite elegant. Those same charges that give us kind of a reality component to what we think is solid. My finger never touches the wood. There is no matter hitting matter. There's a repellency of electrons. And if, as the, it comes around you, you can feel this in these neodymium magnets. And it's very non-trivial. And if you take an alternator and put the output under a uh, under an electrical connection, you can't turn the shaft at all. Not even with a spanner. <laughs> not even with a four-foot breaker bar. It's not that you can't turn it very far. You can't turn it. It is absolutely irresistible. And so I'd like each of you to feel these magnets. That is the force in these motors. Except in the motors you use, it can have a thousand amps of current, and it's a hundred thousand times stronger than those magnets. This is an incredibly powerful thing. It's entirely silent and almost loss free. And that's what I would propose that we use for our personal transportation in the future. And I never get over it. It's just magic that I can, you know, at age 54, uh, the gasoline was $4 a gallon, and they were telling me I really had no choice but to pay it. Whenever they tell me i got to do something, I get kind of tipped. So I went into my garage and swept out a place and built a car and drove it away. And then it struck me when it drove a lot better than I thought it would. Our experience with electric transportation is widely limited to elevators and golf carts. And I didn't know if my 57 speedster would be more like an elevator or more like a golf cart. But when I stepped on the accelerator, backing out of the garage, I very nearly went through the black wrought iron fence in front of the lot. It struck me that I was onto something new. Now, how can a 54-year-old guy in yellow shoes working half days falling down front do that? And why isn't everybody doing it? And the first thing that occurred to me is if anybody knew about this, they would want to do it too. And I'm very pleased that you're here and that you want to do it too, because I think that it goes to some very serious things in the future. If we go off the petrodollar and repatriate 60 of our money suddenly back here and the dollar crashes and we go to $300 oil, the problem is not exactly what you think. It goes to an immediate 300% increase in the price of our food and our pesticides and our herbicides and our medicine and all, everything made of plastic and most of our clothes. And that does not augur well for our financial system. Meanwhile, our leadership and our media, who have made it so uncomfortable to run for office, we no longer send our best and our brightest, but the light in the hall, we 
we wind up with the equivalent of eight-year-old children in the control room of a nuclear power plant learning what the levers do by moving them. And that's kind of alarming. I've fortunately been in two rodeos before where a remarkable thing happened. In America, we do not live by our government and our media. We survive them. And that's done by individuals across the land, mostly in their garages. In what is the greatest wealth creation engine in the world. And it is with some pride, actually, that I feel we've created such wealth that we can run clear, cool, potable water out on the ground and leave it running while we wash our car. And that we can afford to support literally hundreds of thousands of people who do nothing but try to get money from us so they can continue their lives running the government. And it's almost lost in the rounding errors of this wealth creation machine. Now, how does it work? We have a media and a government adulation of large corporations. Large corporations do not really create anything, but they do provide jobs. Anything any one of you invent, the problem you're immediately going to face is making a second one. And then what if people want it? How are you going to make a hundred of them? You can stay up really late and work really hard at one time in doing a, a magazine when I got to about 2,400 copies, I actually stood there for 24 hours putting mailing labels on them and sorting them into stacks. But you can't scale it. Corporations exist to scale innovation. They are not where innovation comes from. I can point to about three things that came out of a corporation ever. Unix was one of them. And it largely didn't matter until a 14-year-old kid named Linus Torvald rewrote it because he couldn't afford it in his bedroom. Now everyone uses Linux. Apple Computer, that story has gotten a little twisted. These guys lived three blocks from Hewlett Packard, which was started by two guys in a garage. And they did build a computer because they were a little frightened of what they built first, which was a uh, telephone bypass system to steal long distance calls. And they decided they'd get in trouble with that. And so they built a computer. And they went to have the board fabricated. And as you all know, you can do that for 25 bucks. In the 1980s, you couldn't. It was quite expensive. And when they took it to get it fabricated and make a real PCB for their computer, they made them order 12 of them. And the original mission at the Homebrew Computer Club was to sell 10 so their two would be free. Little known fact, they didn't sell all 10 of them at the meeting. But that's how Apple Computer started. Today, Apple Computer has a larger cash reserves than the United States government. They have over $100 billion in cash. And of course, they employ tens, hundreds of thousands of people. But every single corporation you can think of started as one guy in a garage, or if he could talk someone else into buying into the dream, two. It doesn't work with three because you immediately start a uh, fight over who gets what money from future sales, and it all breaks up and, and it doesn't even get done. So you can't do it with three guys. You can only do it with one or two. That's, that's your two options. And everything you see around you today, here, and every place you go that's a material thing started as an idea, usually in one guy's mind. Now I watched this play out in the development of the personal computer. And I watched it again from a very privileged position, by the way, afforded me by luck and happenstance being there, uh, with the development of the internet. And 
may have never meant anybody that innovated anything that became something eventually. Who at the time really thought it would be anything. When they were in the garage, they were, and they'll tell you this story, I was just trying to do X because I needed Y. I didn't know it would get to be Z. And this isn't a story, it's a cliche. It, it happens not usual, not often, but almost 100% of the time. They were trying to do something else. And they're embarrassed to tell you what it was. Along the way, once they have a $100 million company and the media is there to ask them about the early days, it is not in their commercial interest to explain that it was 12 years of crawling through piss, blood, and razor blades on their hands and knees before they became the overnight success story. And it is not in their commercial interest to say that they were really trying to do a whole different thing that didn't amount to much when they discovered this. But that's how all these companies started. Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Dave Hewlett, Steve Packard, uh, Michael Dell. Pick a company, I can tell you who started it and where the garage was. That's where innovation came from. It's where it always comes from. And it is true that Burlington Northern Railroad could have invented the DC-3. They had the aluminum. They had the design engineers. They had great design engineers. They had the resources. They knew that aviation would be a thing. But they were built to scale railroads. And they could not not be Burlington Northern Railroad. Nissan and General Motors can't not be Nissan and General Motors. And that's why I've kind of picked Tesla, Elon Musk, and J.B. Scrabble, frankly, was one of you guys, and made his dream grow up, and found Elon, and found a billion dollars, and is doing pretty well, and who I had hoped would be here this morning, but as of September 21st, they delivered 132 cars. Nissan's doing 500 a month. And currently that's dropping because of concerns over their battery life. And General Motors has just cut the price of the Volt $10,000. And they find that if they price it just about like a cruise, people actually will buy it in very small numbers. Where are we at in all this? The media and General Motors and Nissan and uh, indeed a, a good number of you think this is we're right at the cusp of it being over. The battle is won. We're not even started, guys. There is a standard F adoption curve to technology that all the King's horses and all the King's men and several billion dollars, you might be able to move it millimeters. And every technology has the same chicken and egg problems. You have to have X to do Y, and you can't do Y until you have X. It's nothing new, and we'll, we'll do it fine. But it starts at the bottom very slowly and grows very slowly in the tinker and innovator stage. And as that picks up steam very slowly, we move into the early adopter stage, which in the, the book, uh, Bridging the Gap, he would uh, define typically in any industry as 2.5% of the market. We have a market in the United States alone of 15 million automobiles a year. You would be able to identify this as being in the early adopter stage at about 375,000 electric cars per year. We're at about a tenth of that. And so I don't think we're very far along. I think we're still at the thicker and innovator stage. Remember, it never looks like you're about to change the world in the garage wrestling with the problems of how to get your batteries charged. But having been through this two or three times, I consider it an enormous privilege to be in the room with you today, and I can't tell which one of you is going to be it. And there may be several, but I have no way of predicting 
I don't like our government and our president. I can't pick winners and losers. I can kind of identify them after they start to win. And maybe a little earlier than most, but I don't get to pick them. I don't know who it's going to be. But I do know the likes of where it will arise, and it's with a group of people like you. Uh, if you can buy into the, the belief system. The, uh, the other thing that I look for as a publisher, and was certainly uh, pleased to find it in the personal computer, and uh, even more so among the internet service providers and bullet board operators, is a certain passion about doing it. Um, the PBS operators of the early 80s would often have 15 or $20,000 invested in a bullet board that brought them nothing, nothing at all. Um, and that would probably be $50,000 in today's money. Um, the cost of an electric, building an electric vehicle, I, I hate to appear unsympathetic, but the pioneers always had the arrows in their back, and it's always expensive. But you guys are playing at the tricked out bass boat hobby level. Thirty or thirty-five thousand dollars is not a lot to be on the frontier. Um, there's no guarantees of success. In fact, the odds are pretty small. Um, one out of a hundred. But as it worked out with the PCs and with the internet, that wound up being several thousand people. Last year, we had three people at the convention who know nothing at all about electric cars. They just missed the old ISP times we used to put on. <laughs> I wanted to see what I was up to these days. And, and there is some interest among that group and some retreading. They're gradually starting to get an interest in electric cars as being the next frontier. The thing I look for in PCs, the thing I saw in our internet service providers, was passion. They were on fire behind the eyeballs and you can look in their eyes and see it. And I see that passion in this group and our viewers every day. And it's enormously exciting for me because part of this is really just driven by will. And it's really a function of um, a grassroots uh, movement, mostly males and mostly middle-aged people, and sometimes not the best socially adjusted people, certainly in the case of the internet guys, um, but who simply stand up and take charge of their area and forge off into the future in spite of the government who didn't really do it and in spite of the media. And in fact, for many years, with everyone they knew, including their wives, their brother-in-law and everyone else, telling them, you're little, you're ugly, your mother dresses you funny, and why do you do that anymore? And, and how, how, does, how do you make money at that? And where is that going to lead? And uh, the, the problem is, with limited resources, by the time a technology develops, you can't go run around and get in front of it. You have to have been there doing it, as I was telling one of our vendors. In order to lead an industry like the electric vehicle industry, you have to build it. If you wait till it's built, you can't play it. You're shut out by the money. And so you have to get out ahead of it and lead it. I uh, think it's enormously exciting when I look at the passion. And I would say my experience with this group is 10% of them just want to build themselves a car, and the other 90% in the back of their minds think, I don't know how, but there's something in here I can do that I can turn this into a business. I would like to assure you that there is. But I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> you have to be the innovators, and I can't even tell you who will win and who will lose, who will lose their house and their wife and uh, everything, and who will wind up with a $100 million company. But I plan on being front row center to watch how that turns out. And so I'd like to welcome you to the second annual electric vehicle conversion convention. And uh, thank you for allowing me a 
to watch. Let's take a 10 minute break and I want to introduce our keynote, Jamie Straubel, who isn't going to be here, so George is going to be the keynote again this year and he'll do just good or better job. So let's get a cup of coffee.